am so excited to be with you all today. It is going to be an incredible, incredible day. How many of you just wake up expecting an incredible day? Because sometimes we wake up not feeling like it's going to be an incredible day, right? But we can always trust that God is going to do something. And I, I want to encourage you all today. Is it okay if I step on a couple toes just here and there? Is everybody okay with that? It's always a goal of mine. I have to step on just a couple little toes. But, you know, I wear pretty heavy boots, so I won't step too hard. I'll be gracious. I'll be gentle. But I want you to leave here encouraged today. The thing that we love about this series, we have been laying a foundation of faith, of what the essentials of faith really are. Sometimes it's so good and so important to go back to your foundation and just take a peek at your foundation and say, is, is there anything missing from my foundation? Is my foundation really strong? And some of y'all are in here maybe laying a foundation. So you need to know all the pieces that need to go into that. So that is what this starter kit series is. Has anybody ever purchased a starter kit of any kind? Like just, just a starter kit. There's only a couple of you. That's amazing. So the amazing thing, the beautiful thing, the brilliant thing about starter kits is that companies know that sometimes we have to encourage people. Just We gotta give them just a little taste, just a little glimpse of what something really can be in order to get them all the way in. And that is what we are doing here in this Starter Kit series. We want you all to get the basics so that we can hook you in just like a real little Starter Kit does to make you say, oh, I want more of that. I know there's, there are more great things that this thing can do. I can't wait to jump in. So we've been doing that. Week one, Pastor Robert Morris gave us the foundation of giving. Week two, Pastor Daniel gave us the foundation of stewardship. And we are going to move in today and continue in that vein. We are talking about how faith affects and has relationship with our generosity and our legacy. Amen? Amen. All right, so I'm going to start off by asking you a question just right out of the gate. I'm going to ask you to really think right there at your seat, what is my legacy? And I'm not talking about what kind of inheritance you're leaving your kids. I'm not talking about your retirement fund. I'm not talking about any of that. I am talking about what it is that people think of when they think about your life. What is it that people automatically just immediately think of when they think about you? In our home over the last couple of years, some of you will remember, it's hard to imagine that it was a couple of years ago, but for anybody that remembers, who remembers that I, I stabbed my hand a couple of years ago cutting open an avocado? Okay, so some of you do. Myself and avocados have a, a love-hate relationship. So I just love avocados, and I'm clearly not the greatest at opening them up because a couple years ago, I stabbed myself almost all the way through my hand, oh, cutting open an avocado. I know, it was bad. It was really bad. The pit broke, and I was trying to dig it out, and I ended up almost digging out some of my hand. But the point is, my children will not allow me to go anywhere near knives because this is what they think of. When they think of mama and avocados, so much so that if I'm cutting anything, my two biggest will come and stand next to me and be like, mom, mom, you okay? Should you be using that right now, mom? Like I am the adolescent in the family. Like it was an accident. I had a mistake one time and you can't forget it. Same thing is true for avocados. When we go to the grocery store, they're like, I don't think we need those. Those aren't necessary, mom. I'm like, but I'm still gonna eat them, guys. But the truth is I marked them. I marked them with a moment in my life and we all do the same thing to everyone else in our lives. So my question for you is, how have you marked the people around you? What do they think of when they think of you? Do they think, wow, she is a great woman of faith. He's a great man of faith. Is that what they think of? Do they think about the kindness that you exude? Do they think about the words that you speak? Are those words positive words? Do they uplift them? Are they encouraged when they're around you? Or do they think, man, every time he comes around, it's just like, oh, oh. Is, that, is that what people think of? Are the words that you speak, are they followed by actions? Or do you carry empty words with you where you go? Are you a person that people think about generosity when they think of you? Do they think about the way that you care for people, that you love people, that you give towards a need? Are these the things that people think of when they think about you? 
And some of you might be like, well, you're asking me if people think of a perfect person. No, I just wanna know what comes to people's mind. What is it that you leave when you leave a room? And my second question is, are you living a life of faith? Are you living a life of faith? And if inside your heart you're like, ah, I don't know that my life really reflects faith, then my follow-up question for you would be, why not? Why not? Why are you straddling the fence? Because I think so often in Christianity, a lot of the time, people find themselves in just enough. Just enough. I, I reached salvation. I know that Jesus is the Lord of my life, but I live however on earth I want to live. Why? Why do you do that? Why don't we take that next step in relationship with Jesus? I think there's two reasons a lot of the time. I think the first one, a lot of the time, I think people think it's just too hard. Like there's, I'm supposed to be perfect and I'm gonna, I'm gonna fail at that, so I won't even try, won't even show up. I think sometimes people think there are so many things about this, this faith and this Christianity and this belief system that I just don't know so I'm not gonna look silly. I'm just gonna not even try. And I think there's a lot of misinformation that comes with that as well. And I wanna clear some of that misinformation up today, okay? Is that all right? Y'all good with that? Awesome. Well, a little bit ago, we went on a trip. We took our whole family, my husband, all of our kiddos. We have four kids. We all piled in the car and we went to see my dad. And while we were visiting him, he really, really wanted to do something special with the kids. He wanted to give them a special memory. And so he wanted us to take them to this little drive through safari park um, close by his area. And we were like, okay, dad, we'll go. So we all piled into um, the SUV that we had. And at the time, my husband drove us. And when we got there, we got to the, to the gate and the gentleman at the gate told us about some of the rules. And one of the biggest rules that he told us was, you are not allowed to put the windows down. So just keep the windows up. And we were like, oh, well, whenever we envision a safari park or we've seen people that have taken their kids to safari parks, like you see all kinds of animals up by the windows and the windows are down and they're feeding them, but not this one. They were like, no, keep the windows up. We were like, okay, all right, well, well, I guess we'll try. So we drove on in and drove around. We looked at all these different animals. And at one point, we came up on this really huge camel. Like, he was twice the size of our, our big SUV. So we are all crammed, mind you, into this SUV. It is myself, my husband, all four of our children, my father and my father's wonderful wife all with us. So there were eight of us squished into this vehicle. And in this moment, this camel, he kind of notices us driving up. Like you could tell he was walking. Anybody ever seen a camel walk? Like they walk real, real slow and considerate like. And he notices us and he just kind of turns towards us. So in this moment... The rest of us are like, oh, how cool. My sweet husband is like, you know, it would be funny. It would be really funny if I roll the windows down right now. And if I roll the windows down, I mean, we watch America's Funniest Videos with our kids all the time. You know the videos I'm speaking of. This is what was in his mind, that if he rolls the windows down, the camel's gonna come up to the car, it's gonna stick its head in the window, it's gonna freak all of us out, and it'll just be the funniest thing in the world, right? So he does so. He puts the windows down. He gets some of it right. He puts the windows down, and all of us in the car start, well, not myself. I kept it cool. Well, <laughs> steady, steady Eddie. But the rest of the car was completely panicking. All of the kids were screaming. We were all like, no, put the windows up, put the windows up. And he's just sitting in the front laughing and laughing and laughing. And the camel does what he thought the camel would do. The camel walks over to the car and it acts like it's getting ready to get inside of the windows because, I mean, this thing is huge. It could have stuck its neck all the way through the vehicle. And everyone in the car is screaming. And all of a sudden, the camel decides, I don't want to do that. I would like to eat the mirror off of this vehicle instead of sticking my face inside of it. So this information that my husband had in this moment of, I'm going to do this thing and it's going to be really funny and everybody's going to just laugh. The camel literally tried to eat the mirror off of the side of our car because my husband was misinformed about what this would look like if he played a little prank on the family. And in that moment, he realized 
didn't play out the way I thought it was going to. I thought that was gonna go a different way. It did not eat the mirror off of the car, but it was an incredible moment to realize sometimes we anticipate things will go way, some way. We expect that it's going to look a certain way. We've seen it work another way for somebody else. And when it doesn't work that way for us, we assume maybe we did something. We assume maybe we're the problem. Anybody ever been misinformed like that? Sometimes I think one of the greatest places we are misinformed as Christians is in our faith and what we believe faith should look like. Sometimes we accept the idea that it's our perfection or our form of perfection or our really, really, really good behaviors that cause the kind of faith that makes mountains move, right? It's when we're really, really great that mountains move, right? No, or if we know someone that has really great faith, sometimes we think they're just so amazing that they have that kind of great faith. Like that person was born having that kind of faith. They literally came out of their mother's womb with that kind of faith, right? How many of you have ever made that, that had that thought before, that assumption that that person is just that incredible? And sometimes certain people are gifted to have additional faith. But what is the error in our thinking is when we see someone with great faith for us to assume that they did not go through a lot to get to that point of confidence in God. Another issue that we can have is we can also, a lot of the time, make the excuse, well, like that's just not my personality. I'm not the kind of person that just has an incredible amount of faith. I'm a little bit more of a, of a pessimist. A re, some would say a realist, right? Anybody ever heard that before? I'm a little bit more of a realist than that. I don't really see the glass as half full all of the time. But I would challenge you again that we cannot compare physical strength to spiritual strength. It's a very different category. And unfortunately, this can lead us to believe that if we aren't good enough, then God won't answer our prayers, that God won't show up when we need him, that God won't hear us, that God won't turn his face and his countenance towards us, that we will be excluded if we're just not good enough. But I wanna encourage you today that that is not what the word says. So let's start at the beginning of faith, amen? Romans 10, 17 says, so then faith comes by what? By hearing, and hearing by the what? By the word of God. So what this scripture is telling us is that faith develops and grows within us when we hear the word of God. We find the word of God in the word of God, in the Bible. So our faith develops and grows when we hear about who God is, what his nature is, what he has done in the past, what he continues to do, and what his promises are to us. Our faith does not grow and develop because we are oh so incredible and we have the amazing grace to believe. It begins because we know of God's grace and his mercy towards us. Faith begins with the knowledge of God. That is the very beginning of it, is the understanding of who God is. So often in our lives, we only take our understanding of God based on what somebody else said he was. We only develop the little bit of faith that we have based upon what our parents told us or somebody that we respect said or a special prayer that someone prayed for us. But we are missing out on so much that we could be walking in when we understand who God is for ourselves. I love what, what Paul, the Apostle Paul, wrote in the book of Ephesians. He wrote this letter to the church at Ephesus when he was imprisoned himself. He wrote this letter when he was probably not in the greatest place of faith. He was probably quite discouraged. But in this moment, he chose to encourage the church. And what he said to them was he said in verse 17, I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. Now, wait a minute. So wisdom and revelation, those don't come just so we can have an answer to our problems? Wisdom and revelation are not just when we're in a sticky spot and we need to know what we're supposed to do? That's not the only time we're supposed to have wisdom and revelation. No, Paul says that wisdom and revelation is so that we may know him better. 
It is when we know him better that we know what the solution is. It is when we know our God personally that we actually can hear from the Holy Spirit what we should do in a moment. It is so that we would know him better. So I wanna ask you today is what is, your, what is your concept of faith in general? And I want you to see how the word defines it. Hebrews 11.1 1 says, now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. Our faith, if you're writing anything down, I want you to write this down. Our faith is our posture of confidence and surrender to God. Our faith is our posture. Anybody know what a posture is? A posture is the way we position ourselves, right? Anybody ever walked into a room where somebody just had a real confident posture and it makes you, it makes you go, I can ask that guy, he's bound to know what, what I'm supposed to do right now, right? Because you can recognize a posture that's confident, but at the same time, faith is a posture that's confident and that is also surrendered. That posture is your positioning. That confidence is your trust. That surrendering is your willingness to say, God, as you will. As you will, Lord. Whatever it is that's in your plan, God, that's my heart. Y'all, would you welcome my husband up here? He, I always love when he comes up and helps me. Go ahead. Okay, okay. So we're gonna, we're gonna demonstrate for you. He's, he's the best, the best um, help that I have, and I'm, I'm his help, but he, yes. we help each other really well. Yes, uh, I wanna demonstrate to you all a really big, a really big example of our posture of confidence and surrender, okay? Anybody ever been a part of a really fantastic trust fall before? Anybody? So we here are gonna show you what a trust fall can look like, what it does look like. I'm gonna, I'm gonna catch him. So I'm gonna catch him right up here. No, guys, I'm not really gonna catch him. He's gonna catch me. We do not want you to video this and it to go all over the internet, so I'm not catching him. He's gonna catch me, and we're gonna prove the point the same way. But the important thing to recognize, again, is what is faith? It's our posture of confidence and surrender. So a trust fall that looks like that is very simply just like this. Ta-da! Great job, honey. Great job. But, yeah, it was a was touch and go there. Yeah, I thought I was gonna accidentally drop you and then make church milk. Yeah. Don't look at that. Um, so in this situation, that was a perfect example of what, what that should look like. It was so easy. Now, I will tell you, it, it wasn't that it never went through my mind. Oh, my goodness, is he going to catch me? It wasn't that. But it was that I positioned myself, I trusted him, and I surrendered. And I let him catch me how he needed to. Now, how many of you know it doesn't go like that all the time? Y'all have probably seen the videos of option number two, which we're also gonna show you. Maybe you've been a part of option number two because you had somebody behind you that you were like, I'm not sure they're gonna catch me. <laughs> I have full confidence in this guy behind me that he will catch me. But so much of the time, we approach a trust fall like this. Like, okay, you ready? Yeah. Okay, this is, so this is our option two, y'all. I'm ready. Okay, 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 you got it? Should, we, should I come a little closer? Or sure. think we're good distance? Okay, okay. So I'll tuck my arms in, okay? And then, and then you kind of catch me under the arms. Catch Just catch me under the arms. Okay, okay. Well, maybe I'll put my arms out so it's easier for you to catch me if I go, if I go like that. Okay, 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 okay. No, 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 I'm ready. I'm ready. Okay, I'm good. Okay, no, no, okay. Uh, should we get a pillow? What if we had like a pillow just in case? There's a pillow? Oh, Anthony, thank you so much. This is perfect. Oh, it looks like a labradoodle. I feel like... I feel so much more comfortable with this pillow because then if I, if I fall, if you don't catch me, then I'll, I'll just fall. Okay, 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 I'm ready. So then I'm, if I'm gonna go, then I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go. And here I come, here I come, here I come, here I come. Here I come. Okay. <sighs> How many of you know that that's the way we approach the Lord? All the time. How many of you know that this is how we take our hearts and our needs to the Lord because we say, okay, no, okay, God, do it just like this. Do it just like I asked. Make sure that you're here at this particular time because I don't wanna wait much longer because then I may worry. And if I worry, then I don't know if I'll be, if I'll be ready to receive it when it gets to me. 
How many times do we apply that kind of trust to our faith in God? How many times a day? How many times do we doubt his word and his truths because we think that it has to go our way? I wanna question your thinking today and I wanna encourage you that we do not grow great faith. We don't. Our faith grows us. We do not grow great faith. Our faith grows us. But we have to choose it. We have to choose to step out in faith. We have to choose to walk in the amount of faith that we have. We have to make the steps towards God. But it will be the thing that grows us and not the reverse. So I want to give you four ways that your faith will develop you. Amen. Y'all ready? All right. Number one, the first way that your faith will develop you is faith will cause you to believe in Jesus. And that belief will lead to salvation. Romans 10.10 says, For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified. That means deemed righteous. The righteousness of Christ. And it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. You are delivered. So our first step in faith is stepping toward Jesus. But again, let's go back to Romans 10, 17. How do we have enough faith, enough belief? It's because we've heard the word of God. It's because we've heard the gospel. It's because somebody at some point shared the love of Jesus with us and told us what Christ did for us. And we have enough belief in that moment to step in faith towards Jesus, toward salvation. John 14, verse six says, Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And Ephesians 2, eight says, for it is by grace you have been saved. Through what? Through faith. And this grace is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God. So salvation is our first step in faith. And then salvation grows into something that's really, really important in our journey with Christ. And it's a really big word and it scares a lot of people. That is sanctification. Everybody say sanctification. Elbow your neighbor and say, you didn't say it right. Number two, faith will produce a commitment to sanctification. Now let me help you with this because sometimes this word sanctified is a, it's become a dirty word in church because it can either be religious and legalistic or it can be biblical. And that's what we want an understanding of is the biblical definition of what sanctification really is. So salvation is a matter of your spirit. It's a gift from God. It's free. It doesn't cost you anything. It's simple. All you have to do is believe to receive. But sanctification, on the other hand, it comes after salvation. And it involves a lifelong journey of becoming more like Jesus. That's what sanctification is. It is the process of becoming more like Jesus. It is growing in character. It's growing in obedience. It's growing in a desire to do things God's way instead of our own way. It is an outward expression of what Christ has done within. Let me tell you something that messes with the heads of Christians all the time. That is that you can still be fully saved, but not yet fully sanctified. You can be fully saved, but not yet fully sanctified. Because how many of you know we do not reach perfection right here or right here or right here? We're just moving towards Jesus. So it is a process of growing in sanctification And it is our faith that establishes that growing commitment to allow the Holy Spirit to purify our hearts and our actions. Because again, our words and our actions should line up. Now, I want to give you a few scriptures here. I want you to write them down because it doesn't really matter what I feel about sanctification. I want you to hear the word. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, This means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is what? It's gone. And a new life has begun. That means at salvation begins a new story. 
At salvation begins a new journey that we are to be on. And the old things that once were a part of our lives have to go back with the rest of the life. And the part that's hard is sometimes people think, well, I got saved and God didn't take away this part of me. God didn't take away this thing that I, that I like to do that I find myself in. So he must not mind it too much. It must not be that bad. I can probably continue acting like that or doing those particular sinful behaviors because God didn't take it from me. And if God doesn't like it, he would have removed it from me at salvation, right? No, we gotta have a little bit of investment into this, y'all, because we get to walk out a life of faith that reflects Jesus' heart. He wants us to choose every day who we serve. He wants us to choose every day what kind of life we want to be surrendered to. John 17, 17 says, sanctify them in the truth. Your what? Your word is the truth. Okay, so back to Romans 10, 17 again. So our initial faith of salvation comes by hearing and all the rest of the faith that comes as well. And then hearing by the word of God. And then sanctification comes by the word as well. So what is this telling us, y'all? We gotta be in the word every day if we want to live a life that looks like Jesus. If you want to know what the standard Jesus set for us is, you got to be in the word. You have to understand it for yourself. Otherwise, it is just rules. And if it's just rules, it means no change in your heart. It means no reason why you do it differently. Otherwise, it's just just stuff I got to live by. But when it's a revelation because you've been in the word and you see the heart that God has for you, it changes you. And you say, I want to live different. I want to come at this in a different way. Psalm 119 verse 9 says, how can a young man keep his way pure? By guarding it according to your word. So again, it comes back to the word. The Bible is still relevant. It is still the most holy word there is. It is still God-breathed. It is still just as powerful as it ever was. We just got to be a little bit more diligent about it today because we've had it for increasingly more years and more years and more years, and we just get used to it. Sometimes Bibles get kind of dusty. I don't want to step on your toes, but it's true. Sometimes we find that our Bibles are in the corner of the room that we just don't go to and we don't get there. So then when we find ourselves in a spot of knowing what God wants us to do, we don't know what his word is. And we can't remember because too many things have distracted us since then. Gotta get in the word. Amen. 1 Peter 1 verses 14 through 16 says, so you must live as God's obedient children. That's like a zinger, right? For us as adults to be told we're supposed to be like obedient children. This is the reason why we discipline and train children is because we are training children to be obedient to our words, right? To be obedient to our instruction so that when they become adults, they recognize now you gotta be obedient to God. Now you have to know how to obey. There's never a moment in your life that you should be not under submission, As an adult, God still desires for us to be obedient adult children. Says, don't slip back into your old ways of living to satisfy your own desires. You didn't know any better then. Yikes. But now you must be holy in everything you do, just as God who chose you is holy. For the scriptures say, you must be holy because I am holy. Amen? Sometimes people get scared of that holy word because they're like, oh, you're saying I have to be perfect. No, I'm saying you need to be leaned into Jesus. Be leaned into Jesus. Let him be bigger in your life than you are. Let him be stronger in your life than you are. Get everything that you get from the presence of Jesus and time with him will wash off some of that other stuff that still needs to go, amen? Amen. Holy Spirit will allow you to be more mindful of God's standards than your own, which is what we wanna do. 
Sometimes I think, um, I think of those really tall dads. Any of these really tall dads in the room that love, it's really cute. This is a cute thing. You can lift your hand. Um, sometimes I think of these really tall dads that walk around to little kids and they're like, here, high five guys, high five. And they're like, jump up here, all the way up here. And little kids are like, oh, I got it, I got it, I got it. And they're nowhere near the high five, right? Right? But the dads are still like, you can do it. Come on, you can do it. Sometimes I envision the Holy Spirit like that with us. He's like, here's the standard. Come on, come on, come on up here. Set your standard right up here. You can do it. Keep trying, keep going. A little more, a little more. But so often we quit because we're like, that standard's too high. You're asking too much of me. I can't be perfect. I'm not perfect. I'm not ever gonna be perfect. That's okay. Keep trying. Keep aiming a little higher each time. Just a little more, because how many of you know with that sweet dad that walks around and says, come on, buddy, high five, when, when little buddy doesn't make it all the way, he brings his hand down just a little bit. He says, you can do it, you can do it, you can do it, hop right here, and he comes down just enough so the little one has confidence to walk away like, yeah, I can jump really high. Holy Spirit does the same thing for us. He says, set your standard here. Hey, hey, here's a good standard too. This is good, there's no shame, there's no condemnation. It's okay, just get here, I'll take you here. I'll get you to the next level. Just don't quit. Don't give up where you are. Faith pushes us to want to be more like Jesus. That's the most important part. We have to want it. Want desire instead of requirement, amen? amen. Number three, your faith will equip you to serve others. Your faith will equip you to serve others. When we are surrendered in faith, purpose awakens in us. There is a new purpose inside of us when faith is rising in us. There's a new purpose that says, I will have my eyes wide open to see what's in front of me, what it is that God is calling me to, what the need is around me because of purpose within me. We see daily opportunities to be generous. Generosity means that we are open to the kindness of Christ reflecting through us to other people. Kindness means simply looking for opportunities to be kind to people. This is an act of generosity. Kindness means that maybe you tip the server that didn't really do that great. That's kindness. Maybe you pay for the drink of the person behind you uh, at the coffee shop. That's kindness. Maybe you just offer a really great big smile when you didn't know somebody or when you didn't feel like it. Everybody smile really big right where you are. Go ahead, you feel silly, do it. Now tell me how you feel. You feel, you feel good. <laughs> Counselor Jackie here, when we smile, it brings out really good chemicals in the biology that God designed. So when we carry ourselves, not in a fake way, but sometimes if you catch yourself just down and you say, I'm gonna smile, I'm gonna smile, I'm gonna do it, you will feel better. It may, it may not have fixed your situation, but you will remember, ah, it's not that bad. It's not that big of a deal, but your smile for someone else could change their life, could change their day, could change everything about how they feel about the validity of their own life just by you stopping and smiling at somebody you didn't even know. That's the kindness that comes from generosity. Generosity is also giving. The word calls us to sow our tithes and our offerings into the storehouse, into our local home church. The reason for that is because this house, your house that you're called to, God has entrusted to know exactly how to meet the greater need. And when you sow your tithe and offering to the local house, that is your trust to God, not to people. That's you trusting God to say, oh, money is so hard for all of us, right? So hard for all of us to give up money. And that's why God asks for it, because it is another way that he knew would connect with us as humans. It would be difficult for us to do that, but in doing that, it's another way for him to immediately prove, I've got you, I'm there. You don't have to tell me how to catch you. Just let me catch you. We run, that's good. We run so fast in life, I think sometimes we pass right by God. And he sets these principles in motion so that we will stay connected. 
so that we will continually have to come back. Okay, I'll get back on track, God. I'll remember again, God. Oh, that was hard again, God. Okay, I need you again for this, Lord. He knows that we will need to come back to him continually. James 2.17 says, so also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. I love the way the Message Bible says it. It says, isn't it obvious that God talk without God acts is outrageous nonsense? It's quite the translation, right? But it's true. God talk without God acts. That's silly because it's fake, right? That's not real if there's not anything behind it that shows it to be real. I love the book of Luke, the 17th chapter. In this chapter, Jesus is talking to his disciples and he's just explained all these things to them and they were kind of overwhelmed by it. And they said to him, oh Lord, increase our faith. And I love what he responds to them. Some of you in here have probably heard this passage a lot of times. I want you to look at it from a different perspective. Jesus says to them, if you had faith like a grain of mustard seed, you could say to the mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea and it would obey you. So the disciples come to Jesus and they say, increase our faith. God, give us more faith. They're like, you've got lots of it. Clearly, let us have some. And he references this mustard seed. The mustard seed is just the tiniest. It's a reference to if you had the smallest amount of faith, what he says to them is not, okay, I'll give you faith. What he says to them is, you have a little bit? I want you to take that little bit of faith that you have and put it into action. Give me an opportunity to show myself in your life and your faith will boost in that moment because you will see me at work. And guess what happens? There's your increase of faith. But it's not here, I'll just give it to you. It is, what do you have in your hand? Give it, surrender it. Let me show you that my word is good. Let me show you that my word is true. And when you step out in faith, I will meet you there. And then the next time that you have an opportunity for faith, your story is, no God, you were right there. I remember, I know. I don't carry the anxiety about giving something up because I saw you there the first time. Faith grows when we act in faith. And that leads us to our fourth point. Faith will lead you to walk in power. Faith will lead you to walk in power. When faith goes from that mustard seed faith, that initial just smallest amount of faith, to the kind of faith that believes in salvation, to the cleaning up kind of sanctifying faith, and then to the generous kind, the generosity that comes along with our legacy in life. Then you begin to walk in a different posture of power because you have a very different understanding of who God is and what he will do for you. Exodus 15 verse two says, the Lord is my strength and my song. He has given me victory. It is because the small moments of small faith that we were able to say, God, I trust you with this, that he showed up and made us victorious in that moment. And now you're able to stand at the back and say, no, I am strong in my faith because I've watched him come through. I've seen him show up. He may not have done it like I, like I wanted him to. He may not have done it the way I thought was the best way. When I said, I'll hold my arms out straight, God was shoving my arms back down. He may have said, I will honor your heart and I'll meet your need, but I won't meet it that way. He may have said, just like Jesus said, I'll increase your faith, but I'm gonna do it a different way. And I'm gonna let you have some investment in it as well so that the next time you have a moment of faith needed, you'll jump up to the plate knowing, God and I have got this, it's okay. I don't know how he's gonna work it out, but I know that he will. When you put his promises into practice, you see the truth that's in Luke 137 that says, for no word of God will ever fail. For no word of God will ever fail. This invalidates the limitations in our mindsets, guys. It invalidates all the things that we say, this limits us. Things limit us, nothing limits God. So if you're relying on your own strength, yeah, you're limited. 
But if you are linked up to the God of heaven and earth that would move all mountains out of your way because he loves you that much, then there is nothing that limits you according to his will. And there is great freedom in that. Freedom is where we get our power from. It's in freedom when we're not bound to fear, when we're not bound to all of these things from the past that we find the freedom of God. And freedom carries one of the greatest legacies there is because it requires faith. And when others see the testimony in your life of your posture of confidence and surrender, it sparks faith in them. That's one of the greatest, greatest legacies that we have to give. 2 Corinthians 5, 7 says, for we walk by faith, not by sight. That word walk indicates motion, right? It indicates movement. And when we choose to step in faith, there is growth there every single time. Amen? Amen. Amen. Faith brings salvation. It brings sanctification, even though we don't always want it to. When you feel the conviction of the Holy Spirit, just pause. Pause. Just pause, don't be stubborn, and pray. Because if God is convicting something in your life that doesn't need to be a part of your life, take a moment and talk to the Lord about it. It's the best approach to it. Faith brings salvation, sanctification, generosity, and the greatest legacy that we could ever give as people. And that is more faith. If we allow it to do its work. Amen? Amen. Would you all stand to your feet? I want to pray for you today. For all of you that are in this room, if you would just close your eyes for a moment. For all of you that are in this room watching online, I want to pray for you that might be in a little bit of a struggle in your faith or a crisis of faith or a moment where you feel like, "Ah, yeah, maybe I gave up because I just, I wasn't sure that I was enough. And I wanna pray that you would be reminded in this moment that every single step that you take toward God is a step that makes his strength within you that much greater. Right now, God, in the name of Jesus, I just ask you for every single person in this room watching online, watching at all of our locations, God, I pray right now for a spirit of faith to rise up inside of them, Father. Where there is frustration and fear, I ask that you would remove it with your peace. Where there is doubt and shame and condemnation, I ask you to remove it with your love. God, where, there is, where there's hurt, God, where there's disappointment, I ask you that you would remind them of who you are, God. Place a desire to know you more within every single person that hears my voice right now, God. And I ask you, in the name of Jesus, that they would grow in such great faith that there would be a holy, holy desire, holy desire to be near to you. We give you all of the praise in the name of Jesus. With every eye bowed and every eye closed, I wanna pray for those that do not know Jesus as your Lord and Savior. If you are in this place and you would say, I don't know Jesus, I don't know Jesus like that. I don't know Jesus as my Savior. The reason that we do all of this is because we have a God who loves us. The Bible says in John 14, 6, that he is the way, the truth, and the life, and the only way to the Father is through him. We were all born into sin. Every single one of us was absolutely born with a sin nature, but because of God's great love for us, Jesus died on that cross, and he paid the price for those sins. And on that third day, Jesus rose from the grave and that resurrection power allows us to live in freedom today. And maybe you're here and you would say, yes, I want that kind of faith that you spoke of. I don't know Jesus as my savior and I want to. I wanna live free from sin. I wanna live full of purpose and I wanna live filled with hope. Romans 10, nine and 10 says to confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord and you will be saved. All it takes is your surrender. And maybe you're the second invitation and you would say, I used to know the Lord like you're talking about, 
but I grew away from him by choice and I stopped following after him. And today I want to rededicate my life. In just a moment, I'm gonna give everyone an opportunity to surrender your lives to Jesus in this room and online. And if you are the first group that I mentioned and you would say, today is my day to find freedom and faith and make Jesus the Lord of my life, or you are the second and you would say, I want to rededicate and get things right with the Lord. If either one of those is you with boldness, with that confidence, with that surrendering, as an act of faith and a declaration that you wanna give your life today to Jesus or rededicate your life, would you lift up your hands with great boldness today? All across the room, people are lifting up your hands. Amen, I see you. I see you back there, we see you all. Can we celebrate those? Amen, amen. It's the most important, valuable choice of your entire life that you will make in surrendering your life to God. With every head bowed and every eye closed, would you all pray this prayer with me? Would you say, Jesus, today is my day. I wanna give my life to you. I ask you to forgive me of all my sins. Thank you for your forgiveness. And I repent right now. From this moment on, I am choosing to live for you. You are my Father, you are my Savior, and you are my Lord. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray, amen.